It is a great honor to welcome once again to the show, Dr. Mark Dooley. He is a philosopher and author based in Ireland. His latest book is, of course, an edited volume of Sir Roger Scruton's his writings. Uh, it is titled Against the Tide, and we talk about this in the same podcast two UK prime ministers ago. How are you today, Mark? Thank you for joining the show. I'm delighted to be back, and thank you for having me. Very well indeed. Thank you. Yes. Uh, we've agreed to talk about Hegel and his influence on Roger Scruton and how he is a conservative. Uh, but I should like to begin by asking, so you are based in Ireland at the moment, and I wonder how does it feel like to still be a part of the EU when your immediate neighbor has wrestled, not without significant turbulence, out of it? Well, it's still, that turbulence is still rumbling on, as you know, and, and uh, the, the turbulence mainly caused by us, actually, nowadays, uh, and the status of Northern Ireland. Yeah. Um, you know, there are advantages to being in the European Union, insofar as uh, it keeps uh, tyranny at bay, uh, as it were, and... Um, we have the prospect of, uh, in this country, down the line, um, people who would assume power here who weren't always friendly to the state and uh, certainly left a legacy of barbarism over what they call the troubles or the period between the 1970s and the late 1990s. Uh, and therefore, these people who are now in the political ascendancy um, uh, will find that they can not maneuver as they might like to otherwise because of the constraints imposed upon them by the European Union. And yet there is a the question of sovereignty. Uh, I admire the English because the English should never have been subsumed into a kind of a, a globalist uh, a monolith such as the European Union fancies itself to be. Um, being as it was the victor in World War II. Um, uh, and of course, the the structure of the European community, economic community as it was then, was mainly to um, reintegrate uh, Germany into the community of nations, not to allow Germany to establish its own monolith um, uh, into which Britain would be subsumed. So, um, of course, different history for both nations and um, the benefits of the European Union to Ireland are, um, uh, have been enormous uh, economically. There's no doubt about that. But sometimes there's more at stake than economics. You know, there's identity, there's tradition, there's um, self-determination. Um, and as I say, there is pro there is protection uh, on the other side, but there is protection against forces um, that, you know, would seek to usurp the constitution or would seek to usurp the state for, for their own gain. So <clears throat> uh, I have mixed feelings about it all, I must say. Um, but in, in terms of the, the, the English, I, 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 I do not regret even as an Irishman, their decision to leave, because I mean, you, you know, for them, it was all about the reestablishment of home. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing, is there popular anti-EU sentiments in Ireland at the moment? Not necessarily, no. Uh, the there is a there are there are people who do not like the, the European Union for all sorts of reasons. Uh, you always have those in, in, in all of the European states. Um, but again, the Irish people are going through a period of, uh, kind, of uh, kind of identity turmoil, for want of a better expression. They don't know who they are actually anymore. Um, and that's a long conversation that one could have, and it's not for this morning, but it's, you know, the, since the foundation of this state, uh, we have uh, had a for the well for the first eighty years or so there was a very well established identity which was both conservative and Catholic uh, and autumn really all overnight that disintegrated 
um, for all sorts of reasons, not least because of the uh, abuse crisis within the Catholic Church, which has now led to an ex to, to do the opposite extreme, uh, which is a woke, liberal, um, uh, you know, socially free for all um, uh, social arrangement, and um, and that you see, it's it's kind of a you know a swing of the pendulum right to the other side. And um, being in the European Union facilitates that now because it protects the, uh, the, 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 the ideologies of the day. Um, so I would say, no, there isn't a, a crisis, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, belonging to the European um, Union. Um, but, you, you know, down the line, you never know what might uh, arrive. You know, it, it's uh, the, I see other European nations biting at the bit to reestablish their identity, their traditional identity. And um, the thing about Ireland is, it's always a bit Johnny come lately. You know, it always catches up with the rest eventually. Twenty years always too late, however. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I'm currently in Vienna. Um, for disclosure, I'm doing a master's program at uh, international studies. And one of the courses that I had to do was uh, institutional law of the European Union. And I believe four weeks into the course, I finally understand why the British choose to leave because of all the laws and rules and regulations and bureaucracies. It can overwhelm anybody. But to connect this to our main topic of today, the idea that we should have a league of nations with the shared political aims and governance, say democracies, were, was first proposed by Kant in his theory of the perpetual peace. And that has led to the creation of the League of Nations, of course, and the United Nations, and most recently, the European experiment. So I wonder, you know, uh, since I'm having a Kant scholar on my podcast, how would Kant, the originator of the perpetual peace theory, react or respond to uh, these uh, leagues of nations? Well, it's hard to, to know because, you know, he was writing in the, uh, the 18th century and, um, uh, you know, the world was a much smaller place then, um, and the, the the challenges, although great, were not as vast or as complex as they are now, due to globalization and due to the fact that our globe is a, is a, is a village, really. Um, and uh, we know in real time what's happening, you know, in China and uh, Cambodia and uh, France and whatnot, uh, whereas they didn't. So. Uh, you could almost say that his vision of a, uh, you know, this uh, community of nations was, by our standards, slightly naive uh, and idealistic. But it's not without philosophical comment, because <clears throat> uh, what can't, whatever political structures a philosopher proposes will always be you know, be rooted in his or her epistemology or metaphysics or whatever it is. And in the case of Kant, that was a very abstract, empty, universalist metaphysics. Uh, it was a it was an, a, an ideal based on the fact that all human beings everywhere uh, somehow share the same aspirations because they are made the same way. That's political and social aspirations. And of course, that is not the way it is, as we very well know, just reverting back to our the the, the origin of today's discussion, where, where we spoke about, you know, the, the complexities between identity in Ireland and Britain and the European Union. Um, and it was this, I think, that this, this kind of universalist tendency in Kant, uh, which motivated um, his idealist uh, successors, most notably Hegel, about whom we're speaking today, um, to root their epistemology in something which was a, a lot more uh, mm -hmm. local and a lot more um, particular 
to the circumstances of uh, individuals and individual communities and so forth. So if Kant is the great uh, you know originator of the of the of the, the, the of, of the liberal impulse, um, uh, I would certainly contend, um, and I don't think it's even up for argument, although history might contradict me at times, uh, given what happened in the 20th century, but then again, we can discuss why that is a wrong uh, uh, in reading of history. Um, but uh, Hegel gave us that sense that things move much more at a community-based level, and that human beings are rooted, their identity is rooted, in the local rather than the transnational. So um, the reason global fraternities do not work and they are always held with suspicion by those who have to endure them is because human beings are naturally not that way inclined. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, uh, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, uh, drew from Kant's perpetual peace theory in order to make his case for the end of history, which was recently updated at the end of the 20th century by Francis Fukuyama, where, of course, uh, if I'm reading Hegel's uh, view on the dialectic correctly, um, the thesis and the antithesis can, with the process of dialectic, of uh, conversation and talking, can uh, form a quote-unquote third way that fuses the best elements of the two, and that will be the solution. And in some ways, the end of history is when, I, to update it to the 20th, 21st century, the forces of democracy and anti-democracy, I guess, um, can somehow fuses the, the two best elements of each other and and make a whole new system based on the synthesis of democracy and anti-democracy. So I guess how how would how would Hegel uh, envision the end of history, and are we coming any closer or farther to that? Well, that's the most misunderstood uh, term of Hegel's, perhaps the most misunderstood term of Hegel's, or misappropriated. Uh, uh, for one, uh, uh, the, 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 it was popularized, well, it was popularized by two people, one Karl Marx, uh, regrettably, and two Francis Fukuyama, somewhat more uh, positively. Um, however, I've written a lot about Fukuyama uh, and why I do not think that his use of that term as uh, you know the the realization of liberal democracy as being the 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 the, the pinnacle of the of the Hegelian's dialectic. I don't think that's right, actually, um, because the leisured uh, way of life that we live in the West now, certainly, and in the Western democracies, the leisured, apathetic, detached. Um, cynical, hedonistic, narcissistic uh, way of life is certainly not what Hegel had in mind when he uh, uh, envisioned the end of history. Um, the, to put it very simply, the end of history for Hegel simply means that point when we overcome all alienation from the surrounding world. Um, so the child begins in a state of alienation. All children do. All human beings do. They're really, they, 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 you know, they, they, this is the great uh, criticism, implicit criticism that Hegel has of uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, whose famous um, uh, phrase, man is born free, but everywhere he is in chains. Hegel would simply say, no, man is born totally dependent, totally in chains, and his purpose in life, the whole rhythm of life is to become free is to become independent, is to become free of bondage and alienation, all those and dependency, all those conditions that we have at the formative stage of life. And the whole process of the dialectic is for the individual who starts out in alienation to come into harmony with his or her surrounds, uh, with his or her world, 
uh, and to in by engaging with it, by working with it, by appropriating it, by molding it in his or her own self-image, that the two become one. So take, for example, what you're doing now, uh, you're in a university, you're, uh, in, you're uh, you know, uh, engaged with uh, the great texts of the tradition in which you're learning, and those texts are the, the geist or the spirit of the authors uh, that, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're studying and learning about. And your whole agenda is to engage with them to the point where it becomes yours. Um, and so, so the distance or the distinction or the division or the alienation between you and those writers and that text and that vision and those voices uh, is cancelled. So there's a there's a there's a synthesis between you and the books and the authors that you're you're dealing with, and the Hegel would call that the you know the, that's the the uh, objective substance and the individual substance becoming one. You being the individual substance, the objective substance being uh, uh, those writers, uh, those ideas, uh, those uh, laws, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, th those things that shape our world, our cultural world, that are foreign and alien to us at the beginning, but through study and through engagement and through grappling and through reading and through appropriation, we become one with them. And that enables us to identify with all of those who have gone before and who've settled our world and made it what it is. Now, basically what you're doing there is you're engaging with ideas and the idea becomes yours. It's, it's not that the substance is an immaterial substance, the idea becomes yours and you're shaped by it and it and you shape it in turn because it's not a case that you become one with something and then are transformed into it. No, through the mutual engagement of the two, both are altered and you take this off in a new direction, mm -hmm. perhaps. Uh, but the so the end of history is when we all come to recognize and recognition is a big uh, word for Hegel, when we all come to recognize ourselves in the social world, when we're at home in it, and when the social world takes up its home in us, as it were. Um, and so therefore, there's no more striving. There's no more uh, self-recognition to be achieved. There's no more alienation and bondage to be overcome, but that we are at rest, at peace with our world, with our history, with our politics, with our laws and so forth and so on. We see ourselves reflected in them and they are reflected in us in the way we behave. That's what he means by the end of history, which is very different, I think, to most uh, interpretations. I see. Now, I'd like to examine how Hegel is reflected and passed on by two of his students, one who live in the 19th century and the other who live in the 20th and recently passed away in the 21st. Um, so the reason why I hesitated to engage in the text of Hegel, well, one is that his prose can be very difficult. And secondly, one of Hegel's most famous students is Marx. And, you know, we can, you know, there's no need to elaborate further on that. But um, so my question now is, how does Marx interpret Hegel and to what extent is he, I guess, accurate about Hegel and to what extent does he deviate from that, from his philosophy? Well, he takes seriously the dialectic between human beings and the world. Um, he takes seriously Hegel's privileging uh, of history um, uh, as distinct from, you know, the, the, what Hegel tried to do in philosophical terms was to overcome the uh, correspondence theory of truth, where the whole idea of uh, philosophy was an attempt for us to see how far uh, our concepts or ideas match the world as it is in itself, the world apart from us human beings how far our ideas and concepts represent or mirror uh, uh, or correspond to that world. Hegel did away with that, uh, brushed all of that away and said that the, the, the motor of change, uh, as I've been explaining to you, is our desire to become one with the world. Uh, and uh, uh, because the world and us are so dialectically intertwined 
there's no point about in thinking about what the world is like apart from human beings. You know, it's just it's a, it's it's just a philosophical thought uh, process. Uh, you know that uh, or thought game that um, can never be solved. So there's no point in going there. So uh, removing that idea, removing the idea that there is some set of objective conditions that the uh, the human mind can represent or uh, mirror or correspond to means that history and change now become central to philosophical speculation. Um, and Marx took that idea very much to heart and his his uh, on the surface, at least, you might say his idea of the um, feudalism, capitalism, and socialism as the, the tripartite dialectic of communist theory is uh, very much Hegelian. And people who like to look for scapegoats, um, especially amongst conservative people, uh, will say, well, we don't read Hegel because, look, look, you, you know, without him, we wouldn't have had Marx, we wouldn't have had the devastation of the 20th century, we wouldn't have had communism and so <laughs> forth and so on. But that's nonsense. I mean, as it's like what Roger Scruton used to say and what Chesterton said before him, that that's like... Um, uh, blaming love on the Trojan War, you know, it's, uh, Hegel is not responsible for what his successors uh, do with his ideas, especially if they read them wrongly. Um, the, pro the problem is then when you go and you study Marx and you see what he had in mind, it's a purely, as we all know, it's a purely materialistic vision of the human condition, which is so far removed from Hegel, it's like chalk and cheese. <laughs> Basically, what happens is that uh, Marx takes us as far as the famous parable of the master and the slave in the phenomenology of spirit, which is very early on in the phenomenology of spirit, I might add. Uh, Hegel's, you know, grand scheme. So this phenomenology of spirit, which is the, the grand schema that uh, uh, Hegel famously wrote as Napoleon was riding through his his, the, the, his, his, uh, his place of residence at the time in Jena. Um, this was, uh, I hesitate to say it was his magnum opus, but for many it, 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 it is. But in that, we have this very famous parable of the master and the slave, um, where Hegel shows that the master is only a master by virtue of his relationship to the slave. The master cannot be a master without having a slave to affirm him in his mastery. But likewise, the slave is only a slave by virtue of the fact that he, they all were he uh, uh, in those days, is, is a slave by virtue of being related to the master. So there's this co-implication of opposites where they uh, achieve their identity. And this is the way it is with all dialectic. Each achieves their identity only in, in and through being related to one another. OK. Um, and what uh, uh, Marx likes to emphasize, of course, is that the master uh, is only the master by virtue of his relationship to the slave. And therefore, the master is slave to the slave because he cannot be the master without the slave. And the slave, of course, has a greater uh, has is 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 uh, has at the edge on the master because the, the slave, of course, is the one who does the work. The slave is the one who tends the gardens, cooks the food, shapes the world in his or her own image, and the master is alienated from all of that stuff. Claims, of course, the master claims it as his own and takes credit for it. People come in, oh, we love your house, we love your gardens, we love your food, but of course the fact is, and he says, oh, thank you very much, as if he has produced it himself. It's like somebody saying to you, I love your coat, but of course, and you you taking credit for it, but you didn't make the coat. Uh, the coat may, it may have had a dubious history uh, and is, can be credited to some poor worker who never gets a day off in two months uh, in some other part of the world. Same thing. And so we get this kind of uh, communist theory of alienation uh, that uh, Marx pushes and his successors push. Now, that's where it stops for Marx, okay? The rest of the dialectic, which is the richest and which is the most important part of Hegel's dialectic, what he calls spirit or Geist, is that whole realm of culture and religion and art and philosophy, which is in, 
without which we cannot be fulfilled as human beings, according to Hegel. You take that out of the equation and you will not have uh, the reconciliation with the world, with yourself, uh, with, with, with history that uh, Hegel sees as the fulfillment of uh, human striving. Um, and that is true. I mean, we do not feel uh, at one with ourselves or with the world without understanding ourselves artistically, culturally, spiritually, metaphysically, and, and so on. I mean, think of the people that um, in any society that are cut off from their culture, they're always the ones who are, and I mean culture in the, with the uh, high culture, most especially, they're always the people who feel most alienated. Mm -hmm. uh, they're always the people on the outcasts, um, are the outcasts. They're always the people on the outskirts who have, who are not fully part, not fully integrated into community and rebel against that community because they feel as though they are missing something or they don't feel at home there. That is essential. And that's why Hegel says without that, you will always feel uh, the, the alienated and uh, divided from uh, your common, uh, the common home. So what Marx does is he, let's say if the dialectic moves from A to Z, Marx keeps us at C. <laughs> Hegel takes us to Z and brings us in fully to ourselves. So, um, and that's of course what the, the famous claim then that Marx turns Hegel on his head um, uh, you know, um, uh, he subverts the dialectic. He cuts away uh, all of this, uh, what he calls false consciousness, which of course is uh, the most important part of consciousness or conscious realization or self-realization. Uh, and Hegel is nothing, not a great psychologist too, uh, self-realization that Hegel proposes for us. So again, those who try to make uh, the, the connection between Marx and Hegel stick, uh, you know, just if they read the text and they, they read the the works, uh, it just doesn't it, it doesn't fit. You know, it's it's not right. Yeah. And of course, uh, that brings me to uh, Roger Scruton's reading of Hegel. As I've mentioned, he's a second student of Hegel. If Marx, uh, I if I give Marx credit for drawing me away from Hegel, I give Scruton credit for drawing me back into Hegel, and uh, it is the emphasis on uh, home and culture and nation and community that, which Scruton emphasizes, that uh, makes Hegel so appealing to me. And in one of your lectures on the conservative Hegel, um, you said that Roger Scruton is... Uh, uh, attempts to reconcile Kant's view of the world through a dualistic lens and Hegel's uh, view of the world through a dialectic lens. So how would you how would you examine uh, Scruton's reconciliation of these two uh, great thinkers? Well, I don't think he does reconcile them at the end of the day. I think, well, he may do it despite himself. Let's put it that way. I think that's more accurate to say. Yeah. Um I, you know, ultimately, uh, there's this great tension in Scruton, and it's the only thing we ever really argued over, philosophically, that is. Uh, a great tension between his Kantianism and his Hegelianism. I mean, to read Roger Scruton in the main and to look at his life, you would say this is an out-and-out -out Hegelian. I mean, the emphasis on home, the emphasis on belonging, the emphasis on uh, becoming, you know, so integrated into one's environment that the environment smiles back at you with a human face. Um, uh, in, in Roger's aesthetics were uh, an aesthetics of home and beauty and how we can be reconciled to our world through the work of beauty, you know, which is very Hegelian too. Um, but all of that said, uh, his lifestyle was third, true and true Hegelian. His, his, his polit politics were true and true Hegelian. And yet he was a Kantian. Philosophically, he was a Kantian. His theory of the human person, his theory of the transcendental, his theory of subjectivity, his theory of freedom, his theory of the self was Kantian. And in all his books, that's emphasized as well. So on the one hand, you've got this idea that's rooted in uh, Kant's dichotomy or dualism between the world of appearance and the, the world as it is in itself, or the phenomena and the noumena, um, 
and the world uh, that Hegel proposes, which abolishes that distinction um, entirely and sees the world as and, and our relationship to it as a fully integrated thing where, you know, the world, what, what the, the way Hegel would put it, is the union of subject and object, by which he didn't mean that suddenly our concepts come into full, uh, you know, comp compatibility with, or they mirror exactly the world as it is in itself, because that dichotomy is gone. No, it's that point at which the world smiles back at us, as I say, with the human face, that point at which all striving to become one with the world is overcome, and we are totally integrated in it, where the world takes on a kind of a human uh, look, as it were. It's fashioned uh, in, in, in the human image. And uh, it becomes a home because we identify with it fully. Um, and there's nothing that is beyond the capacity of the human subject to know, as it were, um, uh, and that can be clarified later, but suffice to say for now that there's no thing in itself that keeps hovering on the edge that, you know, that, that, that human beings are um, uh, incapable of knowing. But that's very important. That idea of the transcendental, of something that is beyond the ken of human beings to understand, which is Kantian, what Roger called the transcendental, that is very important to him. And it leads inevitably to what is uh, to what one writer calls a homelessness of the mind, because he cannot fully integrate the human subject with the object, with the, the human subject with the world. Neither could Kant. There was always a scepticism in Kant, you see, and even though Kant, uh, Kant's whole agenda really was to overcome the scepticism of the empiricists, uh, was, and, and the scepticism was rooted in the idea that we can never know the world as it is in itself. Mm. Okay, so our, you know, there's, you, you know, so the, 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 you know, so there's always something that you know is 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 beyond us, is is wholly other, as as, as they as as the subsequent um, Kantian inspired theology would call it. But Hegel overcomes that. Um, so I don't know why Roger would wouldn't take the final plunge into Hegel, considering that everything that manifested after that uh, idea in his works was thoroughly Hegelian and something that I don't think Kant would ever have subscribed to actually, um, uh, being the kind of empty abstract universalist that he was in essence. And that is, that is, uh, it's, well, it's not a, it's not a, um, a major stumbling block to anybody who reads read Scruton, but it's a curiosity. And I think if I were to propose an answer, because you're going to say to me, well, how? Do, why do you think that was, perhaps? I would say it's because Roger was very much in love with, and rightly so because of his training, even though he owed more to continental European thinkers than he did to analytic thinkers. He was trained within the analytic tradition of philosophy, uh, the, 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 the British tradition, and he owed an awful lot to that. And he liked the rigor of that. And he liked the, the lucidity of it. And of course, one of the mainstays there uh, within the European tradition is Kant. And secondly, uh, he was Protestant. And uh, there was always, I felt, something more Catholic about Hegel, even though he was a Protestant, uh, uh, more fulsome, you know, the, the much more colour in him uh, than there was. But, you know, it was very important to Roger, again, for a whole host of reasons, to uphold his Protestantism in his way of life. And um, thus, he stuck with Kant. I see. You know, um... To paraphrase the great late uh, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the simplest, most crudest way for to describe a Hegelian is that he believes that ideas matter. Um, so Hegel, as well as Kant, was put in the school known as the German idealists. And nowadays, the word idealism is associated with, say, John Lennon's is Imagine and is head in the clouds, pie in the sky, utopianism. But uh, in my reading of the idealists, they simply believed that Contra Machiavelli, who pulled politics into the gutter, 
they believe that politics in itself is identified or is associated much more with ideas than with the, I guess, uh, real politic of the situation. Um, so here's my question to you. Um, so how, why does Hegel believe that ideas matter? Well, they matter fundamentally because, uh, you know, from uh, a Descartes on, um, the idea or concepts had to be recognized as, you know, that which mediates our experience and our world to us. There was no point uh, uh, anymore in denying that fact or in saying that we have, I mean, the whole point of the, uh, the idealistic movement was to show or the idealist movement was to show that empiricism was wrong um, and that uh, old, sky, old style scholastic philosophy was wrong, um, uh, that even Aristotelianism was wrong, that took the world as a bare given, okay, a given in experience. And that, of course, is the 20th century analytic American philosopher, Wilfred Sellers once called, he called it the myth of the given. Mm -hmm. um, that you know, the, the, the experience is much more complex, or what we call experience and reality is much more complex uh, than those thinkers uh, believed because uh, it's mediated through consciousness. And consciousness now becomes a central factor in philosophical uh, understanding, and, and it is to this day. Uh, those who like to harken back uh, to, uh, you know, scholastic philosophy and so forth, uh, really want to cut away consciousness. Uh, but for Hegel and for Fichte and Schelling and Kant and all of these people, consciousness was the sine qua non. Uh, the mind and its relationship to the world was the sine qua non. That's where it started, okay? Uh, it was the, the I think, the ich denken of uh, um, Descartes. Um, which was the, the the basic presupposition that you must have. Um, now, in order to refute that, you've got to uh, show why ideas don't matter. But of course, you will only do that through ideas. Correct. And therefore, um, Hegel's whole point is to show that the the notion that that the the, the very idea of objects independent of the mind or of ideas or concepts is itself an idea, okay? And when you can reconcile yourself to that fact, uh, then you have embraced what they call absolute idealism, okay? Uh, where there's nothing, there's no point at which consciousness stops and reality begins, or there's no reality outside of consciousness that we can understand because you have to understand it through consciousness. Um, and even positing the idea of a holy other or something be Just press record. So this idea of the, the let's say, the, the holy other, uh, and this, of course, is all a big critique of Kant, as it were, and his notion of the thing in itself that is beyond consciousness or, co or human concepts, even though it's the ground of, of all uh, human experience, it's, it cannot be known by us because concepts, uh, you know, get in the way of it or uh, hide it, uh, to use language that, you know, unphilosophical language. Um, this idea of the holy other uh, or breaks down once you posit it. Because obviously we know something about it. We know that it's wholly other. Therefore, it's not wholly other. It can't be wholly other if we can posit it or it comes within the sphere of consciousness. It has to be known somewhat. So all of this is where Hegel takes us. And I think that not to go with him, you must be able to show why it is that, uh, or how it is, that some part of our experience escapes consciousness. And how do we know that? Of course, Hegel's 
conclusion is that consciousness goes all the way down. There's no point at which consciousness stops and reality begins. There's no way we can drive a wedge between our conceptions of the world and the way the world is uh, as it is as it is in itself. And um, uh, you know that the, 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 the uh, you know the world and our concepts are so integrated that there's no sense in the idea that we're you know. Uh, that the mind is a, a representation of reality or that we are mappers of reality or something like this. Um, and, and therefore, uh, that means the ultimate conclusion to that is that the world can be changed. Because unlike Kant, who had a set of a fixed set of 12 categories or concepts in the mind that were applied to experience, concepts in Kegel are fluid. We change our minds all the time. And over time, through history, Concepts change, our understanding changes. But notice, as our understanding changes, so too does the shape of the world. Okay, it's not as though the world remains, you know, in one way, and our ideas and our concepts and our minds change, um, and therefore we realize that our ideas and concepts and minds are, are out of conformity with the world. It's not that at all. Our ideas and our minds change. So too does the world. And you can see that you walk into, you you know, you blindfold you, you put you on a plane, you take you out in a particular part of the world, you take 10 minutes in that part of the world, you'll know where you are just by the architecture, the landscape, how the people dress, their customs, their manners, all of which Hegel termed as the geist or the spirit of that, that, that place and that, that people. Um, uh, and this is not to say that the, these divergences between cultures uh, and, and communities, you know, are there to stay. They change, too. And we're all aiming towards a point at which all individuals have overcome alienation within their respective communities and cultures so that they see themselves reflected in the very contours of uh, those places and not as you know, so second class citizens or uh, slaves or uh, subjects to theocrats or whatever it might be. So you know where you are. And the reason is that the mind, the ideas shape how the world looks and how we behave. So if you're in a theocracy, for example, um, you the, 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 the architecture and the fabric of that world will become theocratic. Likewise, democratic or postmodern or um, whatever it is, uh, you know, uh, and more and more the world is becoming to resemble uh, uh, kind of a, the Western democratic structure of understanding, which is what Fukuyama was trying to tap into. Um, but that's, again, not what Hegel had in mind. Uh, mm -hmm. But I can elaborate on that in a moment. But su 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 suffice to say, with regard to ideas, uh, you know, an idealism, that's what Hegel meant, that, you know, the ideas uh, and consciousness and concepts were central to our understanding of ourselves, to our understanding of our world and our place in it. Yes. Um, so continuing on to the theme of idealism, um, the great French uh, philosopher of the 20th century, uh, Raymond Aron, or Raymond Aron, if you are French, uh, wrote this phenomenal book called The Opium of the Intellectuals to critique uh, his uh, Marxist contemporaries at that time who were French. And in it, he pointed out this uh, wonderful contradiction that the French intellectuals of that time who were persuaded by Marxism were infused with both a solid, ironclad belief in the ideals of Marx, of course, but also a complete and utter nihilism of ideas in general and how ideas can change the world, I believe, that has been motivated by what they saw as the failures of the Leninist revolution. So in your reading of uh, Hegel and, I guess, Scruton in our modern times, how can we uh, how can we become idealists in the sense that we understand that ideas matter, but not in a John Lennon sense where we think that that is all that matters and we will stop at nothing to realize these ideas, um, say, Paris students in 1968? 
Well, the difference there, there's a, a crucial difference that you have to draw there between uh, um, um, ideas and ideology. Mm. And uh, what motivated these people uh, and the people that Raymond Aron uh, was writing against was ideology. Um, it was the left leftist Marxist ideology, uh, where a set of ideas becomes almost theological um, and it motivates them to reform their society. And of course, society can be reformed like that. There's no question. Um, but that's not what Hegel had in mind at all. I mean, for Hegel, there were two things. One, the and of course, Hegel writes, he does a history of philosophy, he does a history of history, he does a history of religion, a uh, history of uh, morality, history of nature, all from this perspective, um, and a history of politics, of course, and his phenomenal um, uh, philosophy of right. Um, but for one thing, Hegel wasn't talking about ideology. He was talking about the very, the very, the, 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 the very fact that ideas are, you know, the, the essential to self-understanding and to understanding the world. You cannot bypass them, you know, that, that's as we've just been discussing. So that's very different to what they were on about. Um, and in fact, Hegel's whole idea, not to, not to play on it, uh, was to um, overcome ideology. Um, because you see, Hegel's dialectic was showing how forms of life or forms of consciousness come and go, various epochs, let's say in history, forms of consciousness, come and go, not willy-nilly, you know, not because they just collapse of their own accord, but because they no longer satisfy our desire for self-recognition, self-determination, and freedom, okay? Um, so there is a kind of a, a dialectical urgency in it that is not motivated by any one group, although a group or an individual can cause the collapse, as we've seen in history, to what Hegel called the great men of history, what we would call today the great people of history, who are the trigger for one set of social circumstances or one form of life or one form of consciousness to collapse and another one to spring up. Uh, for example, uh, let's say the um, one thinks of the uh, uh, you, you know the the, um, the 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 distinction between the Greco and the Roman worlds, for example, um, or the distinction between the uh, the Catholic world and the, the world of the Reformation, or the form of life or the form of consciousness, and so forth. One gives way to another because one individual or a set of individuals just realize that this uh, these circumstances are, are no longer adequate to fulfill our desire for self-determination. And uh, so this is leading us towards a point, and not leading us, as I say, in this kind of directionless way, uh, or this what uh, uh, grand unknowable utopia that uh, this classless, castless, society that Richard Rorty, the American pragmatist, will speak about. De Hegel had a very firm idea where this was going to end. When all human beings, and this is, is very much brought out in the philosophy of right, where all human beings see themselves as fully engaged citizens, where the law or the government isn't on one side and the citizens are on the other side being dictated to, but where the citizens kind of embody the laws and where they are laws and responsibilities, where they so identify with the law, the law becomes their own, and they become embodiment of the law. Thus, uh, duty begins, sorry, rights begin where duty and responsibility ends. But we know where that point is because we know the law, and we become the law, and we are not subservient to the law, and we are not alien from the law, but we are fully integrated citizens who respect the rights of others on the basis of our the knowledge and understanding of that law as our own. And that's what makes it this our call. Nowadays, you have people, uh, the large majority actually, who uh, couldn't care less about law, do not know law, um, uh, live a life of entitlement, and rights over and above duties and responsibilities and think that they are free 
Um, and that's not the type of freedom Hegel had in mind at all, that type of freedom that you were referring to. In terms, The freedom, therefore, is for Hegel, is the freedom to live as a fully integrated citizen with knowledge of uh, rights and wrongs, uh, good and evil, um, duty and responsibility, um, and rights as well, but, uh, but not a case of, I have my rights, I couldn't care less about responsibilities, uh, this is freedom. Freedom is casting off the chains of custom and so forth and so on. That's not freedom for Hegel. In fact, he would he has a, he has a word for that, and uh, as he has a and a description of that psychological uh, disposition uh, in the phenomenology of spirit, which is certainly not uh, in 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 the the area of freedom of or spirit. It's in the area of alienation, and that is hedonism. Those who indulge themselves because they believe they can and that they are free to do so, where in fact they are totally enslaved to their passions. Uh -huh. So given our poor internet connection is clearly that this conversation has been deemed dangerous and shouldn't have taken place the same way as Rogers is to the people of Eastern Europe and then the communists of Eastern Europe. But uh, I would like to propose a final question and that is, so, uh, so far we have made the case that uh, Hegel was a conservative, and Roger has made the case uh, with great articulation. And now we can recap that by asking, what is Hegel trying to conserve, and why should we be concerned about these these elements which he's trying to conserve? Well, Hegel is not so much an active conservative as we would think of in the modern sense, uh, or even in the sense of Roger Scruton or any, you know, Edmund Burke or anything like that. Um, although he is, as Roger rightly says, I mean, he is the father of modern conservatism. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason being that what he is trying to do is to, in his dialectic, is to show how everything must be gathered up all forms of life and forms of consciousness that have preceded us. If you are to understand you, yourself and your place in the world and the world that surrounds you and the world that is to come, the future possibilities, you cannot do that without the long detour of memory, as Paul Ricoeur would call it, or recollection, as Hegel would call it, through previous forms of consciousness that brought you or brought us to this point. And that in, that in essence is what study and engaging with the cultural or social substance or the objective substance is. It is that long detour of memory, not passive memory, but engaged memory, you know, where you're wrestling with concepts, you're wrestling with ideas, which have been transmitted to you uh, from previous generations and which uh, go to make you into and have gone to make you into the person that you are in our society, into the society that it is. When you cut people off from that, then it is that they fall back into alienation. Or they fall or they, they never move from alienation to a sense of uh, self-understanding uh, or to full self-understanding, what a lot of people wrongly uh, translate as absolute knowledge, full self-understanding. Um, then that means recapturing or recollecting all of those forms of life as enshrined in our texts, our books, our architecture, uh, our monuments, our culture, our customs, all of it, art, religion, philosophy, uh, the working world, the material world, the scientific world. And this is why Hegel has a dialectic of religion, a dialectic of nature, a dialectic of philosophy, a dialectic of morality, a dialectic of politics and the dialectics of the, of the self, to show that all history in every one of these areas is absolutely the precondition for self-understanding and the precondition for freedom. Because without that, you will feel an alien in your world. You will never feel at home in your world. You will feel cut off from everything that counts and everything that makes your community your home and you the person and the thing and the society that it is. So that great act of reconciliation between self and world happens through this synthesis, this dialogical, dialectical synthesis 
which uh, you know is, happens through all of human experience, formative our formative experience most especially when we're we're becoming one with the world. Um, deprive people of that, and it's most basic. Now, how do we talk about it at its most basic for ordinary people? It means that you lack a good, solid, scholarly education where the truth matters and where that process of recollection and engagement and that long detour of memory is actually given credence over ideology, where the ideas matter as distinct from the ideology. Uh, that's how you become reconciled to your world. And why? When people leave good schools, when they leave good universities, when they leave you know, the good apprenticeship of life, as it were, uh, they feel free. Mm -hmm. They feel free. I have achieved something. Your qualifications are not mere rubber stamping the fact that you are able now to chant the Marxist mantras or to chant the 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 um, the woke slogans. You are able to articulate a scientific vision, a religious vision, a spiritual vision, an artistic cultural vision um, uh, that that is, that has been bequeathed to you by absent generations, and in so doing, you are free. Because now you can move in the world knowing what it's about, understanding what it's about. And of course, uh, Foucault, for very different reasons, said knowledge is power. Uh, one could say that's true, but I would say knowledge is freedom. Okay, Ideas are freedom in the sense that I've been allowing it to Hegel. So the difference between ideology and ideas is very important there and very important for the conservative to understand. But I don't think that conservatism can, I mean, the, the big deficiency, I think, in conservatism is this lack of intellectual roots and understanding. But you have it all there in Hegel. It's not mere polemical. It's not a mere instinctual um uh, you know, clamor for old things or to preserve or conserve old things or forgotten things. This has deep intellectual roots, and it's in fact it's the it's 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 essential for who understanding who you are and where you belong to. And Hegel gives us that. He gives us those tools, and his work is an, is, is 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 a way of seeing that the philosophy of conservatism is actually in many ways, uh, philosophy per se. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, um, thank you very much, Dr. Mark Dewey, for this enlightening conversation about Hegel. I certainly hope that by the time this uh, airs, uh, England will not go through another prime minister. Um, I wish you all the best with your future work and God bless. And likewise to you, God bless you. <laughs>